Well, welcome to session 10 of this, uh, the Sea Power Conference, the final session this afternoon. Um, this session commences uh, with a, uh, the signing of an MOU between the Sea Power Centre of Australia and the National Maritime Foundation of India. Um, that MOU uh, will be signed this afternoon by Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan and, uh, of India and uh, Captain Sean Andrews uh, from Australia. Uh, gentlemen, would you like to come uh, up and take over proceedings? Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, sirs, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much. Uh, before we sign the uh, MOU uh, this afternoon, I just thought I'd say uh, a few quick words about the National Maritime Foundation. Um, our good friend Admiral Chow and, uh, invited me in 2019 to uh, come to the Indo-Pacific Regional Dialogue in Delhi, uh, which I uh, warmly received and, and, and off I went. During that time we signed an MOU and the purpose of that is really about the purpose of the Sea Power Centre, which is to encourage debate and strategic thought, particularly strategic maritime thought in the Indo-Pacific. And so on that day, we signed a MOU to work together, which has uh, evolved um, right now from uh, a lot of VTCs, a lot of conferences, a lot of visiting fellows, uh, to now into a more formal working group that has morphed into seven nations and will continue to grow over the ensuing years. Um, today, we're just re-signing it to re-establish the next four years and the next journey in this, uh, in this incredible relationship. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you could please join me and welcome uh, Admiral Chow. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I just wanted to express uh, the sentiment of uh, honour that uh, we in the National Maritime Foundation feel in uh, continuing our relationship with the Sea Power Center. Of all the various uh, structures in the region, I think that uh, the most important, the most dynamic, the most effervescent uh, is going to be the India-Australia relationship. And uh, going forward, anything and everything that we can do to bolster that will be uh, a good thing. And I cannot I imagine a more comprehensive uh, approach than to have track one deal with track one, track one deal with track 1.5 and vice versa, and also track 1.5 dealing with track 1.5. And before I get my maths all hopelessly muddled up, let me say thank you once again. And uh, we look forward to the next four years with a sense of keen anticipation. Thank you very much. Sea Power Conference 2022, our commonality of purpose. But as one of our guests has said uh, this week, a commonality of purposes, uh, in which brings us together. Um, I've been rather spoiled over four years. I was uh, given a great privilege to uh, direct the Sea Power Centre Australia. Uh, it is Defence's only autonomous maritime research centre and was originally commissioned by the then Chief of Navy 30 years ago, uh, Vice Admiral Hudson. Um, our aim is really to, be, to create, instigate, stir debate about issues of maritime character and not shy away from those. Uh, I think over the last four years, we've managed to do just that. But more importantly, um, one of the highlights, if no, actually if I say that the flagship program has been our intern program. Um, myself and the team get to intern between 17 and 21 young Australian and international students under the ASEAN program, under the Defence Cooperation program and under the Australian National University program. Um, and anyone who's had the privilege of coaching and mentoring young folk and, not, and some not so young folk know it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful job. Without further ado, we're going to be on the fly this afternoon. It's going to be a bit live and loose. So what's going to broadly happen is uh, I'm going to welcome on stage the finalists to this year's uh, CN's essay competition. Uh, three wonderful uh, young Australians who will join us on stage and in the spirit of TED Talks will present their research or their papers in three minutes. On completion of that, the way we're going to do it in the spirit of TED Talks, or let's say we're in Navy Sea Talk, the Chief will get a question and the audience will get a question and please use the app, and our wonderful moderators will determine who gets up. After that, the first tranche of the Australian uh, Un National University interns will come up, and they will present their research. 
um, which I can tell you from uh, analysis overseas, and I know it's been cited broadly in Australia academia, that some of their research is considered compelling. And I think you'll find today that when you hear how people hear some of the research, we're talking about stuff from ungoverned oceans, uh, contested legal domains to American exceptionalism. Uh, and you'll see a broad range of topics that I'm sure will uh, poke your interest. And then finally, once they're finished, the chief has a question, the audience. And then we bring up the uh, Young Turks. For those who are unfamiliar with Young Turks, it was about a young reformation group of reformists against authoritarian, authoritarian regimes uh, that brought about change in the Ottoman Empire. But the Royal Navy grasped this a century ago and that they used it as a vehicle, as a platform to stimulate maritime thought. Um, this Navy's good friend and retired Admiral James Goldrick, uh, over 20 years ago, brought the concept back. And it's, um, it's been a wonderful legacy that I've, I've pushed forward. And so your Young Turks this year will present also a variety of ideas, uh, and a variety of um, thoughts uh, to share with you this afternoon. And on completion of that, once again, a question from the Chief and a question from the audience. So without further ado, uh, enough from me. I would like to invite up the finalists in this year's Chief of Navy essay competition. The theme was noting the commitment of the Indo-Pacific nations to a commonality of purpose, security, prosperity and good order. How might navies best serve a common interest? Ladies and gentlemen, can you please welcome on stage uh, Lieutenant Sarah Casey, Sub-Lieutenant Jemina Shorts, and Mr. Sean Cameron. Uh, Sean Cameron represents the Open Division. His paper was The Law of the Jungle and Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Sarah Casey uh, speaks to stabilising the Indo-Pacific in the centre of the New World. And Jemima Shorts will speak to rising tensions in the Indo-Pacific, stabilising the environment, maritime environment, through region building and strategic responses. Sean, since you're sitting right there, I'd uh, please take the stage. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> thank you to the Royal Australian Navy and the Sea Power Centre for inviting me here today. Uh, the maritime century has seen the world become increasingly reliant on the oceans for trade, security, and prosperity. The rising prominence of the maritime domain suggests that navies are well positioned to serve the common interests of Indo-Pacific states in a modern landscape characterized by geostrategic competition and a shift towards gray zone activities. In such an environment, we can look towards a lesser known text of security strategy for guidance on how smaller and middle powers, such as those of the Indo-Pacific, may maintain security, prosperity, and good order. The text I'm talking about, of course, is the Jungle Book and the poem, The Law of the Jungle. Bear with me. This poem proposes the importance of cooperation in that the wolf alone is nothing without the pack. Nations across the Indo-Pacific are increasingly facing threats alone in a region experiencing maritime coercion, divide and rule tactics, and territorial encroachment by larger powers in the maritime domain. Increasing security, prosperity, and good order should focus on developing the strength and ability of smaller nations, leading to alliances and increased capability in aggregate as opposed to nations building hard power alone. Indo-Pacific states should be empowered to contribute to their own prosperity and security and be active participants in taking opportunities and overcoming challenges. Examples of such endeavors include the Australian Pacific Maritime Security Program and the Defense Cooperation Program. These programs are examples of cooperation leading to strategic relationships maritime capability for participants, and people-to-people -people ties that cannot be replicated through links resulting from the simple provision of developmental aid, vaccine diplomacy, or transactional trade. 
sea piracy and slavery, maritime cybersecurity, and climate change are further threats facing our Indo-Pacific neighbours in the maritime century. It is through cooperation that a chart is coursed through these maritime challenges in an Indo-Pacific that is increasingly interconnected and reliant on the strength and resilience of individual partners for success in a common purpose of shared security, prosperity and good order, whereby navies hold a key place in engaging with regional allies, forming long-lasting relationships and sharing maritime knowledge and capability. Perhaps Kipling summarised best when he wrote, the strength of the pack is the wolf and the strength of the wolf is the pack. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice Admiral Noonan, Navy personnel and esteemed guests. The Indo-Pacific is an international economic hub currently responsible for 62% of the GDP, two thirds of economic growth, transporting two thirds of all oil and 46% of merchandise. We have witnessed how this creates a strategic vulnerability which is escalating tensions between the major players. It is imperative that these tensions are managed and balanced not frustrated and heightened. It is here where policymakers and navies must work together to achieve a strategic equilibrium, which respects the shared common interest, a stable, prosperous and free maritime environment. It is important to remember that countries are motivated by a unique history, culture and geography. Therefore, resolutions must be separated into two categories, region building, which fosters communication, collaboration and confidence and strategic responses to address aggressive, threatening actions from states. Many disputes have arisen due to the ambiguity of ONCLOS, particularly regarding freedom of navigation. Therefore, under region building, the necessity of clarifying the legal framework and consequently a nation's legal responsibility in the maritime environment emerges. However, UNCLOS must remain accessible and applicable to all maritime regions, not just the Indo-Pacific. Supporting the legal framework through specialised Indo-Pacific codes of conduct, which acknowledges the geographical complexity and the disputes regarding militarisation is a high priority, either through newly devised codes or increasing the parameters of existing instruments. Stating that obligations should be codified is one thing. It is another to enforce compliance. Undertaking confidence building measures focused on shared security and resource objective will support the implementation of stronger laws and codes. Joint efforts between nations' naval forces such as disaster relief, search and rescue, maritime law enforcement and maritime hotlines all will foster international relationships built on trust and transparency to enforce the agreed upon laws and codes. However, countries must also develop strategic responses as a contingency plan for region building exercises. One such response is the formation of midilaterals, a diplomatic process of small groups working together to tackle subjects too complicated for the multilateral level. This reiterates the idea of a strategic equilibrium to de-escalate tensions by showing a willingness to form respectful and peaceful security relationships while simultaneously stating that breaches of maritime law will not go unchecked and will be counterweighted by a network of minilaterals. The Indo-Pacific is a strategically pivotal region which will continue to see conflicts arise unless nations conjunctively undertake confidence building and strategic measures to uphold the principle of open free seas for all 38 Indo-Pacific nations. We all hold a responsibility and a capability to devise timely and achievable solutions to foster peace in the Indo-Pacific for all that share our oceans. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honour to present to you my submission in brief for the 2022 Chief of Navy essay competition entitled Stabilising the Indo-Pacific, the New Centre of the World. Commonality of purpose, security, prosperity and good order. 
From my understanding of current regional interest, it seems that Indo-Pacific is defined as a region central to political tensions. The Indo-Pacific is observant to the US and China teetering on the edge of Thucydides' trap, a trap that can threaten not only security, prosperity, and good order in the region, but would have wider global impacts, a trap that warns us of the dangers faced when a rising power rivals and instills fear in a ruling power. Where this rise instills fear, Thucydides, in reference to the conflict of Athens and Sparta, states war is inevitable. A challenging aspect of this essay was the fact that the defined geography of the Indo-Pacific region was varied and often generally similar to the various, often different, definitions of the Asia-Pacific region. The very fact that we call it the Indo-Pacific, vice the Asia-Pacific, is due to the strategic significance and the overlap between the US and Chinese strategy. Within this overlap is our current understanding of the Indo-Pacific region and the Sino-US strategic competition. With this in mind, I made the following conclusions. The Indo-Pacific must evolve towards coexistence to stabilize and avoid a trap of war. Competitive coexistence is achieved through emergence and growth of Indo-Pacific nations, particularly developing nations. And Indo-Pacific navies should therefore enable the continued growth and emergence of Indo-Pacific nations. In order to achieve this, Indo-Pacific navies must ensure the continued stability of the marine economy a term used for the vast resources, shipping and economic significance of the region. This can be achieved through continued military collaboration patrols aimed at deterring illegal fishing activities, affecting resource availability, water pollution and ecological damage. Noting our nearest neighbours will be directly affected by sea level rise from climate change, as well as the increasing incidence and severity of natural disasters. Navies address the effects of climate change, including possible states of readiness, to respond to disasters in statistically prone areas, to reduce disruption to the marine economy as well as quicken recovery, adopt environmentally sustainable practices to reduce shipping emissions contributing to climate change, and remove the language barrier through language studies as a core competence in military progression to improve communication across borders, as well as improve cultural understanding, which is often referenced in language constructs. This interconnectedness and interdependence between emerging navies and thus Indo-Pacific nations, builds this coexistence framework, a commonality of purpose to move away from a place of fear and threat of inevitable war towards a network, network of autonomous contributors ensuring security, prosperity and good global order. Thank you. Uh, outstanding. For anyone who's uh, listened to a TED talk or prepared a short speech to stay on time and on message and summarise comprehensive research into such short time uh, is a truly magnificent effort. Um, what I'd like to do now uh, is uh, open the floor to the Chief uh, to ask his question before we get another one which will come up uh, on the app which we already have. Sir? Uh, thanks very much, Sean. Uh, great presentations by the three of you and I've got 35 questions I'd like to ask, uh, but I'll stick to one. Uh, and I'm going to direct it to Sean. Uh, you had a great summary of uh, the framework in which we operate in, but clearly as you were researching for your essay, I'd be interested in your thoughts on what could or should the REN do more of, or in fact less of, as we engage in the region. Thank you for the question. Um, In terms of what could be done more of, uh, I guess I'm thinking back to the Defence Cooperation Program. Um, I guess up until earlier this year, I was actually living overseas in Bangkok, Thailand, and I was able to uh, work as a teacher in the Defence Cooperation Program over there. And I could see the, the real links that it could build. Um, so I think kind of expanding those types of programs, not necessarily just for defence, but perhaps facilitating other types of engagements. I work as a, a public servant now in education and I can see that you know, there's opportunities for those types of relationships and capacity building in other sectors, not necessarily just the, uh, the military or navy domain, uh, education, law and justice, infrastructure. So perhaps using the, the already existing relationships that the navy has built to, I guess, uh, 
build a path for other sectors, other industries to come after and form those types of expanding relationships in a country, in a region. Uh, and I think that will, I guess, uh, complement the work of Defence Cooperation Program, the Maritime Security Program, things like that. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. Righto, so uh, I'm not going to ask Sean another question. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to flip the court the furthest to the right. So, Sarah, um, I guess my question is simple. You, you spoke about... Um, actually, I'll find my notes. Um, you spoke about stabilising... Or you spoke about the Indo-Pacific as a centre of the new world. So what is the key challenge to getting people to accept, apart from the broad metric, what was the key challenge you found or what was the key point that stood out as perhaps the link that brings us all together to cooperate together? Good question. <laughs> um, in my reading, both uh, politically and then also uh, historically, um, a really good book I recommend, um, Why the West Rules for Now, um, talks about um, the natural progression because of natural resources moving more towards the east of the centre of the world moving to the Indo-Pacific. Um, how can we get everyone to collaborate and work together in this region? It's not going to be hard because there already is a lot of interest in the region. There's a lot of natural resources, um, big focus, all of our, a significant portion of our trade is in the region. It won't be hard to generate this collaboration. I think the key issue will be to move towards the coexistence, which is where I want to promote emerging nations to really need to grow. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. That's wonderful. Uh, well done, all of you. Uh, it's a magnificent effort. Uh, what I'd like to do now is invite the Chief of Navy on stage uh, and, and, and uh, Vice Admiral Jones, retired, the President of the Australian Naval Institute, to present the winners of this year's Chief of Navy SA Prize. Uh, the Open Division, the Junior Division, and the Youth Division, I should say, and the Defence Division. And the winner of the Defence Division is... Drum roll. Lieutenant Sarah Case. Uh, Sarah, before I uh, present this to you, I'd uh, like to invite uh, Vice Admiral Peter Jones to give a, uh, a couple of words uh, about uh, the SA competition and certainly the very, very hard role that he had as one of the judges. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Chief of Navy. And um, uh, I'd just like to say it was a very, very interesting uh, experience this year. Uh, the Naval Institute, for the second time, has uh, provided the uh, judging capacity for um, the competition. Um, and this year, the a &I Council all did the, uh, the judging. Um, what uh, really stood out, first off, was the diverse range of perspectives from, uh, in essays, from really just one topic that, sh uh, that the Superpower Centre had set. Um, also, the range of entrants. We had entrants from every state and territory in the country. We had them from Europe, Asia, and North America. Um, and, um, and also the range of resources and references that people had drawn to um, formulate their own thoughts on the way ahead. And it was a very rewarding um, um, uh, exercise for the Naval Institute and uh, we were really impressed with the, uh, the quality and the enthusiasm that people clearly had um, in the competition. So well done to all participants. the winner of the youth division. Uh, 
Okay, I guess there's probably not going to be too many surprises here if we look at the winner of the Youth Division, Sub-Lieutenant Jemima Shorts. Uh, the winner of the open division, sir. To the last man standing on the stage, Mr. Sean Cameron. <laughs> Uh, whilst I have the Chief on stage and, uh, of course, the President of the ANI, Vice Admiral Jones, I just think I'd like to draw mention to the honourable mentions, mentions, and it talks to the diversity um, of the region. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Shane Hughes, United States Air Force, he spoke about the Quad, mature counterbalance in the South China Sea. Paul Chamberlain, ex-Canadian policy uh, guru who's now at ANU, he spoke to Navies as diplomatic influences in the Indo-Pacific. And last but not least, Officer Cadet Edward Elias, University of Western Australia, safeguarding maritime trade and combating na uh, transnational crime. Joining the Chief on stage now is our three... ..is our three uh, ANU uh, interns. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, could you please welcome Anastasia Caninati, uh, Eleanor Brownlee... Uh, correction, sorry. Um, let me get this right. Cassidy Sneakers, Madeline Gordon and Anastasia Calatani, Calanati. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, it'll be three minutes each. Um, and as I said, um, the, the topics will be diverse uh, and, uh, and quite substantial. We're going to look at everything from jurisdictional conflicts, resource mobility and ungoverned high seas. Madeline, I, I offer to welcome you to take us away. The environmental impact of climate change. Yeah, I think we're all pretty familiar with that one. The health impact of climate change. Heat stress, disease, etc. Also, not a new concept. The economic impact of climate change. Just ask the insurance companies. What we've heard less about, ladies and gentlemen, is the security implications of climate change. Today I want to talk about a subject that Dr. Bergen touched on briefly earlier. Specifically, how climate change is destabilising maritime boundaries in the Pacific to the detriment of regional security. Under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas, UNCLOS, states have special rights to the 200 nautical miles of water surrounding them, the EEZ. To form, say, to form, say the EEZ of the Marshall Islands, voila, to form, say, the EEZ of the Marshall Islands, <coughs> Excuse me. We use the outermost islands as base points, and where there are no nearby neighbours, we jump 200 nautical miles out, and there's our EEZ. But herein lies our problem. Most of these base points are low-lying atolls that are very susceptible to the effects of climate change. If an island becomes uninhabitable, it is then classified as a rock, and no longer counts as a base point. If, say, these two atolls became uninhabitable, the Marshall Islands EEZ would, under a strict reading of UNCLOS, contract by over 200 nautical miles. Now, the key word here is uninhabitability, because when we talk about uninhabitability, we aren't just talking about the submersion of an island due to sea level rise. We are talking about the infiltration of the sea into water tables, poisoning crops and limiting drinking water. 
and more frequent natural disasters in countries with limited economic capacity to fuel recovery. And erosion, and the poisoning of fish that islanders rely on to survive. These issues seriously threaten the inhabitability of islands and their maritime claims. A problem indeed. But, at least so far as the maritime claims are concerned, it's a problem with a potential solution. Last year, the 18 member states of the Pacific Islands Forum, including Australia, issued a statement declaring that they consider their EEZs fixed and not subject to the geographical shifts from climate change. Their EEZ base points will be deposited with the UN, and from that point on, they're static. Are we allowed to do that? Well, no one really knows. There's certainly a push for this approach to evolve as customary law, but it's far from set in stone. Other states could capitalise on this ambiguity, arguing that the uninhabitability of base points make the territory in question international waters, not EEZ. We've already seen in the South China Sea how contested EEZ claims can play out. And the motive is there. These waters are incredibly rich in fish and minerals. And they're big. We're not just talking about a drop in the ocean, so to speak. The EEZs in question total over 27 million square kilometres or three and a half times the size of Australia. In sum, these waters are vast, valuable and vulnerable, and they're right on Australia's doorstep. The, RAN needs to be, the Navy needs to be aware of and prepared for what this might mean for the coming few decades. The Navy, for example, might be called upon to patrol ambiguous waters if the powers that be decide that the evolving customary law warrants enforcement, or asked to assist in finalising the mapping of base points and boundaries for Pacific Island nations such that they meet UN standards. Australia, including the Navy, will have a role to play in navigating the complex security, political, economic and humanitarian considerations at stake here. The livelihood of our neighbours and our region's security are at stake. If Australia is going to step up in the Pacific, now would probably be a good time. Thanks. Anastasia. Thank you everyone for having me today. In 1942, Nicholas Spikeman wrote of the Asiatic Mediterranean, an area approximating what we today call the Indo-Pacific, and wrote of the splendors that it holds. Undoubtedly beautiful, the area has been a hub for transnational maritime crime for decades with piracy, trafficking of people and contraband, and illicit fishing. My research in this area has three findings that the challenges for those combating crime in this maritime domain are unique, that capacity building must continue to strengthen regional institutions, and that the multitude of mechanisms, bodies and agreements combating maritime crime in the Indo-Pacific must be consolidated to achieve efficient information sharing. The first of these challenges, the uniqueness of this maritime domain, arises from the sheer vulnerability or sheer vastness of the ungoverned high seas, a vulnerability that criminal groups exploit. This is exacerbated by the Indo-Pacific's overlapping and disputed border areas, which produce jurisdictional conflicts that obstruct action. Yet the mobility of maritime resources and volume of trade that occurs at sea necessitates action on these issues. My second finding thus argues that capacity building, which strengthens the institutions of partner states, is absolutely necessary, improving the resourcing and coordination of efforts to combat maritime crime and bettering maritime domain awareness. My third finding, however, highlights that these efforts will continue to be limited without structural change. Recent institutions have been successful, but have been limited by their somewhat confused and ad hoc nature. Definitional differences make identifying crime inconsistent, and a superabundance of regulation coincides with gaps in existing conventions. Cooperation has been hindered by issues in technology and, most importantly, trust. While I cannot claim to know exactly how trust should be earned between individuals, institutions and states, there is an overwhelming need for regulatory consolidation in the Indo-Pacific centred around making information sharing more efficient. 
consolidation should be underpinned by a balance between technological standardization and agility to develop a more expansive common operational picture. Visibility to promote deterrence. Confidence building. Sovereignty modeled after agreements like Malzindo. And importantly, cultural consciousness which empowers rather than imposes on the full diversity of Indo-Pacific states. These actions are necessary if we are to look beyond the littoral and island rims of Indo-Pacific states and towards the hundreds of millions of lives that criminal activities at sea destroy. Thank you. Cassidy Snakers. Good afternoon, everyone. The question I'd like to pose to you is this, is coercion a purely offensive tactic? It seems obvious. When we think coercion, we think gray zone operations, the threat or actuality of war as a method to overpower another state into submission. However, in my research, I noticed condemnation, threats, and the use of blockades by the United Nations to halt disruptive conflict committed by an actor during war. This led me to the thought that sort of kick-started my research. Can coercion also be defensive? Key thinkers such as Mahan, Schelling, George, Booth, Till, Grove, and Cable all have expanded on the idea of coercion and some relating to sea power. Yet conflicting concepts have given rise to many different definitions and explanations of coercion theory. As Australia continues to develop and expand its naval resources, it will be important to analyse how naval resources can be used to combat coercive force effectively. In short, my research aimed to understand how Australia could combat coercion through influence in the maritime sphere. The international rules-based order is pivotal to this research. We no longer live in a single state versus state world. The domino-like effect on supply chains, the economy and diplomacy proves that. This is why I developed this framework, mostly to wrap my own head around everything, but also so I could separate and understand coercion and deterrence and everything in between by focusing on the intent. Once we use the international rules-based order as a centre of which maritime coercion revolves around, patterns start to emerge. Whilst the battles of Pyongyang, North Korea's attempt to increase their territorial waters, sought to disrupt the international rules-based order using coercive force, Operation Maritime Guard, a NATO blockade against former Yugoslavia, hoped to fix the international rules-based order and stop the conflict. Although they are both using compellents, it is in the intent that lies the difference. Thus, coercion theory was reframed and repositioned within these four movements, shifting away, shifting towards, maintaining or preserving the international rules-based order. As defensive maritime missions are becoming increasingly multilateral rather than a singular state, this framework recognises maritime activity post-1945 in all its complexity. In reference to early coercion theory, it reflects the position of Schelling that deterrence and compellence are two separate features of coercive behaviour. However, it also recognises by George that compellence should be split into offensive and defensive. Different from deterrence, displayed above as offensive compellence and defensive compellence. However, the framework still rests on the concept outlined by both academics and much more, that all aspects of coercion are reliant on the fact that the target makes a choice whether that is to escalate or de-escalate. Finally, diplomacy uses maritime resources and spheres of influence to prevent disruptions to the international rules-based order and contribute to collective security. To combat offensive compellence, Australia should give priority to de deterrence and diplomacy. My first recommendation was to review and update Australia's maritime strategy. The last maritime strategy tabled to the Australian Parliament was in 2004, nearly two decades ago. A dedicated and updated strategic document could increase transparency with our allies in the Indo-Pacific, as well as enshrining the significance of partnerships contributing to collective security. My second recommendation is to strengthen vulnerabilities in shipping routes through building alliances. As Australia is reliant on maritime trade, Australia's livelihood is vulnerable to any disruptions to shipping routes and thus supply chains. With Australia already involved in Operation Gateway with Malaysia, naval exercises with the Malacca Straits Patrol would set a strong foundation to strengthen information sharing and trust in the region. Like all theories, coercion is complicated, much more than I could cover in a few minutes. 
However, it is only through attempting to understand coercion that we can recognise that sea power through the use of influence, a commonality of purpose and collective security within the Indo-Pacific is of the utmost importance. Thank you. I invite the Chief to ask the question. Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, Madeline, uh, Anastasia and Cassidy, thanks very much for your great uh, uh, papers and, uh, and your thinking on three very important subjects. I've got jobs for all three of you. Uh, Anastasia, I was, uh, I was really drawn to your thesis and uh, particularly uh, working backwards from your almost final sentence that uh, uh, in terms of a specific step up, sort of now would seem to be a good time to do it. Um, I completely agree and uh, I guess I offer the context that we, we actually started a Pacific step up uh, directly by Navy in October 2018 and we've maintained pretty well a continuous presence of naval units uh, in the Southwest Pacific since October 2018. But um, as I listened to you I got a strong sense of, this, of the changing nature of maritime crime in our region and uh, at, at the risk of uh, uh, I guess opening up an old debate about coast guards and navies um, and I note the presence of uh, Admiral Jones uh, in, in, the, uh, in the audience here. Um, do you think that we, Australia, is optimally structured in terms of our maritime law enforcement capabilities? Do you think that we need to have a greater emphasis on maritime police forces, potentially coast guards, or do you think that we are able to conduct effective maritime security operations under our current construct of a strong, medium-sized Navy and the Maritime Border Command? Thank you for the question. Um, without, I guess, trying to seem like I'm flattering everyone in the room and who's, you know, from the Australian Navy. Um, from my research, it became apparent that Australia is a leader in this area, um, even just in terms of um, the trafficking of drugs um, and that sort of contraband, that the statistics prove that Australia is leading um, compared to a lot of other states. Um, my research didn't focus so much on Australia's own mechanisms, but yeah, if those statistics are showing me something, it's that we need to sort of promote whatever we're doing here, which seems to be sort of working across the region, um, particularly in terms of the debate that you mentioned about um, having a Coast Guard. That was a question that was posed to me while I was doing this research as well. And something that I've thought about ever since, and I think what, sticks out to me the most is that while a Coast Guard could be used to, again, promote sort of across the region in these capacity building um, activities um, and our engagement in other areas across the Indo-Pacific, that a Coast Guard wouldn't necessarily add so much to Australia's own security. So that I think I would initially at least prioritise other initiatives rather than the creation of an additional body, which as well, my research was focused on that we don't need anything else. We need to work with what we've got and make it more fit for purpose. Thank you. And so the moderators have come up for a question for Madeline. What is the importance of the idea of international waters uh, given in the terms finds no mention in UNCLOS. Thanks, John. There's really a few points to that. Because international waters aren't governed under UNCLOS, they're not protected. So that map I showed you of the Marshall Islands, that's part of the world's largest shark sanctuary. If those 200 nautical miles plus were to no longer be EEZ, that would not be protected waters anymore. And that would be vulnerable to the illegal, unregulated fishing that we've heard a lot about today. Uh, that in turn has a lot of flow on effects. Uh, in terms of the livelihood of Pacific Islanders, they rely on the fish and the minerals in, in the water for 
their own livelihood, so their own food, but also for their GDP. Um, so if we don't protect those EEZs, we threaten the livelihood of the Pacific Islanders, um, their GDP, and also just open the region up for other states to come in and use those waters for their own economic gain, which in and of itself isn't a great end, but it also, it, it reminds me a lot of the South China Sea. We have these ambiguous claims, and if our boundaries aren't clear, it's quite destabilizing for the region. I'm not gonna elaborate more on what that would look like because I don't want to sit here and be an alarmist. But from where I'm sitting, that's not an ideal situation. Uh, we need our EEZs clear for regional stability and livelihoods of Pacific Island nations. Thanks so much. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, say goodbye to ANIP in interns and thank them very much for their contribution and just uh, publicly acknowledge uh, they were outstanding outstanding ambassadors for their university and for their hometowns, uh, and they're a welcome addition to our workforce, our diverse work, workforce out at Fishwick. So uh, Cassidy, uh, Madeline and Anastasia, thank you so much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can I please introduce you to Sub-Lieutenant Lauren Morley. The city on the hill, the indispensable nation. These idioms are the manifestation of a concept that has come to define American foreign policy, US exceptionalism. Good afternoon, sir, ma'am, ladies and gentlemen. US exceptionalism was the foundation of my undergraduate research at the University of New South Wales, Canberra, and today I'll be discussing its intersection with the theme of IP 2022, a commonality of purpose. What is US exceptionalism? The concept of exceptionalism gains its theoretical beginnings in the work of French political theorist Alexis de Tocqueville in his seminal work, Democracy in America. Tocqueville observed the uniqueness of the American experience, free from the feudalism and aristocracy of Europe, and how this had a profound impact on their conceptions and practice of democracy. Exceptionalism has since proven itself a formidable force, defining American national identity acting as a rallying force in troubled times and driven them under the perceived moral obligation to spread the very values and practices which make them exceptional. In my examination of the past two centuries of American exceptionalism, what becomes apparent is that it is not something that can be turned on and off, rather it exists as a spectrum, encompassing a variety of leaders and isolationist, institutionalist and interventionalist policies alike. Therefore, there is a paradox to exceptionalism. On one hand, it has been the force behind the rules-based global order, and on the other hand, it can and has led to paternalism and a perceptions of an arrogance of power. Arguably, it is the latter that has led to such apathy towards the West, driven by what Todorov describes as universalist exceptionalism, the assumption that the rest of the world ought to mirror America. So where does American exceptionalism intersect with a commonality of purpose? America's position as a great power understandably means that they have a very different purpose in the Indo-Pacific than other states. Therefore, it is an incredibly challenging situation for the US to simultaneously be the city on the hill and share a common purpose. Exceptionalism is a double-edged sword and most effective when wielded for positive common action. So in a world where China offers absolute and immediate gains, a commonality of purpose, ill-defined, and whose sole purpose is perceived as being against China, risk placing countries in the position of choosing between guns and butter. Although it will not be an easy task in such an ethnographically diverse region, the focus of American exceptionalism should be the facilitation of a regional values-based community where we have a commonality on what we are for allowing the US to enact its purpose and building a stronger region in the process. Simply being against something is not as strong or enduring enough as being for something. And in a world where competition is the dominant paradigm, competition is how it should be played. There is a sports movie trope where an underdog group of players rallies around the team's superstar, but then the superstar gets hurt 
and the team must carry on. Those teams don't set out to win when the star goes down, but by playing for something, more often than not, they do. Thank you. Could we please have Lieutenant Hector guterres Bocas? Uh, good afternoon, Vice Admiral Noonan, sir. Uh, it's an honour to be here with you on stage. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sir, as a ma'am, and my uh, very esteemed colleagues uh, in the Royal Australian Navy, um, thank you for allowing me to speak uh, to you today. It's only going to be a few minutes, but um, I, I wanted to uh, express that I'm very, very honoured uh, to be up here talking to you. The theme of the Sea Power Conference 2022 asks us to consider uh, the Indo-Pacific maritime domain in the 21st century, a commonality of purpose. With this in mind and focusing on the importance of the phrase commonality of purpose, I humbly take the cue of the importance of cooperative and collaborative regional partnerships in the Indo-Pacific to be of crucial importance to the navies that comprise our region. There is no argument that the core function of a Navy is its ability to fight. However, we are living in times where the Grotian view of the world continues to move away from the freedom of the seas doctrine to one of a shared doctrine. Mm -hmm. To this end, in the limited time available that I have today, I propose to make note of the opportunity that exists for all our navies to capitalize on the use of ocean governance as an indication tool to promote further regional partnerships. Once the purview of the legal scholars, ocean governance is becoming gradually more accepted, that play, it plays a close, close partner to maritime domain awareness. Our mutual maritime concerns as they relate to the Indo-Pacific lie in a number of strategic and sensitive issues, including the security of EECs, protection of sea trade, the prevention of smuggling, insurgency, terrorism, and the prevention of the degradation of the marine environment, to name but a, but a few. This is not to say that our traditional outlook on, strat on strategic deterrence, sea control, projection of power, naval presence, as well as surveillance and intelligence gathering is not of primary concern for our navies. However, the contemporary global situation demands that our navies increase their involvement in the management of the oceans in every way possible. This management through ocean governance as a principle and the global role of the Navy not only presents us with an opportunity to implement support and develop ocean governance initiatives, but given that the very nature of ocean governance is transnational and brings state actors together for a common cause, will naturally result in the development of further collaborative arrangements propelled by educational initiatives, at least in my opinion. Ocean governance and its close relation to the law of the sea allows us for a unique opportunity for our navies to take the helm in education efforts to disseminate the importance but also the application of ocean governance principles. In this way, our navies can not only contribute to the good order of the seas through international law, but the opportunity to pursue concentrated efforts in joint educational programs to littoral states, and this cannot be understated in its importance. The use of ocean governance as an educational tool has already been applied through the different projects used by states around the globe. However, the specific role that our navies can take by creating joint educational programs with its partners will lead to the creation of transnational cooperation at a regional and global, and global level, opening new opportunities of collaboration that could result in great change. In essence, this approach champions the role of the Navy as a global educator but within the global community. The ability to take the role of educator is not a traditional role that we see our navies implementing. However, it is certainly worthy of consideration in that the effect of this idea will directly lead to further collaboration between our regional partners, but it will also promote a global community-based endeavour that will see the Navy work hand in hand with civil society leading to the well-being of our oceans. Returning to my previous statement regarding the father of international law, Hugo Grotius, it is clear that the contemporary outlook on ocean management has moved away from the Grotian view of the freedom of the seas, and now it has moved to Mare Nostrum, a shared ocean. 
To this end, it is now our mission to ensure that we as navies of the world unite to make this a reality in the 21st century. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please welcome Chief Petty Officer Rory Jacket. Good afternoon, Vice Admiral Noonan, senior delegates, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my absolute privilege and honour to be here today representing the organisation which continues to play an active role in my own personal development. I am Cadet Chief Petty Officer Rory Jacket, a proud Navy Cadet stationed at TS Lismore. As a young 17-year-old Australian, I hope to offer a unique perspective on the importance of reinforcing vital institutions such as the Australian Navy Cadets as the Royal Australian Navy seeks to grow not only in the size and capabilities, size and lethality of its capabilities, but in terms of its people. Its people who by fulfilling a variety of roles remain the fundamental element in our nation achieving desired outcomes and future success. In the wake of our region's increasingly complex strategic situation, it has been announced that the RAN will need to grow to a force that exceeds 20,000 in order to effectively project the maritime power throughout our Indo-Pacific domain. I contend that the ANC is the foremost suitable entity, is the foremost suitable entity that attracts young people from all around our nation to contemplate a career in uniform and that provides a streamlined pathway for those, um, for those looking at sailor and officer entry. As such, the ANC's passage plan to 2023 was developed in order to effectively in order to effectively articulate the organisation's vision and commitment in sustaining a safe, rewarding and enjoyable environment for Australia's youth to develop confidence and a sense of, a belong and a sense of belonging. Through exposure to a multitude of diverse Navy environments, the ANC provides young people with a sense of affiliation and pride alongside defence values of service, courage, respect, integrity and excellence. By virtue, these values will adequately advance their capabilities in the arenas of leadership and management. In the course of this, the ANC is developing the next generation of marine technicians, bosun's mate, Seahawk pilots, or even a future leader of our Navy. Another fundamental element to the ANC's success in regards to personal development is our important relationship with community. A close relationship between those currently serving and the, and those, and the, and the young Australian who seeks their mentorship, guidance and advice will see significant dividends to both the retention and achievement of ambitious recruiting targets. The more closely we can bind the RN and ANC, the more we can better understand, develop and deliver on key outcomes. However, without teamwork, there is no capability for a larger objective. As such, teamwork is an integral part of our framework. The ability to continuously demonstrate resilience, tenacity and courage in a team environment and incorporate it into the everyday lives of young Australians is just one of the many commodities that highlights the ANC above other youth organisations. In doing so, the ANC delivers the requisite mindset required for potential applicants to join the Australian Defence Force and play a key role in ensuring the security and prosperity of our nation, our interests and our allies. As someone who truly aspires to be a part of the RAN's legacy, I understand that my success as a maritime and military professional will be underpinned by experiences I've been fortunate to have as a member of the Australian Navy Cadets. With all this in mind, I make two important requests. The first is to those currently serving in our defence community. We need you. Tell us your stories, show us what you do, and mentor us to become the person who posts into your position and that shares the experience that we all long for over the coming years. While acknowledging the busy operational tempo of our fleet, I feel there is an important opportunity for the ANC to become more involved in the RAN as both organisations advance their joint capabilities into the future. Second is to those contemplating joining the ANC and, the, and to the parents of our younger generation. We need you as well. For the ANC to be successful in delivering young people in delivering people for your future Navy, I've outlined how your involvement is critical. People often remark that lifelong friends are made in the Navy. I can assure you that this is also true in the Navy cadets. 
I can attest that personally I have developed across many fronts thanks to my involvement in the organisation and I hope, in fact I guarantee that others, that you, can, ha can feel the same sense of growth by getting involved. In summary, the ANC has great potential in supporting the RAM as it seeks to grow over the coming years. It is truly an, orga an organisation that cultivates the leaders of tomorrow today. As we look beyond our shoreline, there is an ever-present geopolitical challenge which will demand a larger, stronger, more capable and prepared Navy. I offer the ANC as a valuable medium through which we can pre better prepare our next generation to confront this issue. In the words of our then Prime Minister, John Curtin, the men of Anzac handed on a torch. Now firmly clenched and carried high by the fighting men and women of today. From their hands, it will go on to the coming generations, as it must. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, our last Turk for today, last but not least, Lieutenant Eleanor Brownlee. Eleanor. When I first joined the RAN, the term Indo-Pacific was still a relatively new one with reference to Australia's strategic focus. Donald Trump wasn't yet president and our strategic warning time was thought to be 10 years. Well, fast forward seven years, or indeed since the last time we held this conference face to face, and our geopolitical landscape is significantly different. Regional tensions have continued to rise. Power balances have shifted. Both Australia and our regional neighbours have experienced a series of severe and regular natural disasters. Russia and the Ukraine are openly at war, and we're dealing with the effects, unprecedented, unprecedented effects of a global pandemic. This period is bringing with it new challenges and reigniting old ones. Whilst our allies and partners aim to maintain a rules-based global order and the balance of regional power, we are all also contending with national instability, growing economic disparity, the effects of climate change, and grey zone activities. Because of this, explicit multilateral security commitments can be difficult. In the right framework, though, I think it is these non-traditional challenges that provide a commonality of purpose beneficial to the security and cooperation in the Indo-Pacific. In fact, I would suggest that this is a moment in which nations with common security interests should endeavour to remain affable, able and available. Firstly, be affable. Familiarity breeds trust. It was not long ago that the RAN formally shifted its seagoing focus from the Middle East to the Indo-Pacific region. And whilst we routinely operate with other nations and implemented policies such as the Pacific Step Up, the COVID-19 pandemic has minimised the bonds and cultural understanding developed through regular face-to-face -face interactions at all ranks, be that through courses, sports days, exchanges or port visits. These need to be reinvigorated and reinvigorated fast. Secondly, be able. Eisenhower said that plans may be useless, but planning is indispensable. And this provides a framework through which we can utilize our common challenges. This includes internal optimization, comprehensive bi and multilateral training scenarios, and frequent in company time, particularly in sensitive areas. Reinforcing the principles of UNCLOS, providing humanitarian aid or testing the lethality of new weapon systems are not just independently useful endeavors, they form our planning tool. And finally, be available. The challenge of growing military forces is one which we must all address rapidly. This is clear in Fleet Commander's direction to do everything humanly and legally possible to optimise the fleet in being. Training and retaining a growing force, bringing new platforms online and modernising old ones, particularly with COVID-affected supply chains, is critical to ensure that we can operate at the speed of relevance when responding to the range of security threats we face as a region. And by utilising our specific skills, be that archipelagic familiarity, search and rescue capability or rapid response times, we will continue to reinforce the, Indo the availability of the Indo-Pacific support network. Obviously, there is no simple solution to the issues facing us in the Indo-Pacific. But where implications of alignment make explicit security commitments difficult, common, non-traditional challenges offer us a path to develop our capability and preparedness. Being affable, able and available navies in this post-COVID era provides us the greatest opportunity to ensure the maintenance of the rules-based global order and protection of regional security. Thank you.
Uh, sir, would you like to ask the first question? Uh, thanks, Sean. Uh, and to the Young Turks and the Younger Turk at the very end there, uh, look, great presentations. Uh, really proud of each and every one of you. Um, and I don't have a question for any of you. I've got a question for Rory uh, Jacket's dad. Have you got any more like him at home? And uh, when can we have them and sign them all up? Uh, but seriously, um, I was really impressed with your insights, all, all of you, uh, in terms of not only where we are now, but where we're going into the future. And uh, it's very clear to me that our future is in very good hands. Uh, thank you, uh, ladies and gents. Um, in the interest of time, um, we'll draw this session to a close uh, before I invite the Chief to give his concluding remarks and, in fact, close this conference. But um, I would like you to join myself, uh, join me joining the Chief to congratulate Sub-Lieutenant Lauren Morley, Lieutenant Eleanor Brownlee, Chief Officer Rory Jacket, Lieutenant Hector GB and Commander Chris Watson, putting three minutes together really well uh, and, and really helping us understand our region a lot better. Thank you so much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's a pretty hard, hard act to follow uh, as we come to the close of Sea Power 2022. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow sailors, mariners, industry partners, friends and family of our Navy, uh, thank you for being with us. And in closing, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we've been on this week, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I certainly thank all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who have served in our Defence Force in times of peace and war. It's been my absolute honour and privilege to host the delegations from more than 40 nations and my 39 counterparts from uh, navies across not just the Indo-Pacific, but indeed across the world here this week for Sea Power 2022. We've been able to conduct face-to-face -face engagement after challenging two years that we've been dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic and undoubtedly this opportunity has not only reaffirmed friendships but importantly it's forged a whole heap of new ones. Building and maintaining trust, confidence and interoperability takes a lot of effort, we all know that and I think we'd all agree it's much harder to do that from distance via a VTC screen and certainly from behind masks. But with the shared commonality of purpose that we have clearly contributed to and demonstrated this week, I am absolutely uh, confident that the reconnection that we have been able to achieve uh, has been worth the effort. And certainly doing it from behind, from without wearing masks has been absolutely fantastic. A commonality of purpose, our theme for this year, is something that the Royal Australian Navy continues to strive to embody and we will work with our friends, our allies and our partners always to ensure a free, open and peaceful and prosperous region. While we can't solve the challenges of our region in just three days, this Sea Power Conference has been an important forum to continue the dialogue and to speak very frankly about the challenges that we face, but we face together. I had hoped the, we, the, 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 the weather here in Sydney uh, would have been a little bit better than what we've seen over the last couple of days. But despite uh, uh, a little bit of lack of sun, uh, I've certainly felt the warmth radiating from the friendships uh, that we have generated this week and, uh, and watched the broader interaction that has undertaken between all of the people here. It's been absolutely amazing. It's been electric. There's been some very fascinating and some extremely important discussions held here in this auditorium uh, covering a very broad array of topics. They've included the focus on grey zone tactics and exploring responses to those coercive activities 
that we have seen increasing in our region. This challenge is upon us and it cannot be underestimated. We must continue to build our interoperability, sustain a mutual presence in the region and work together to collectively maintain the rule of law. And as has been said on numerous times this week, our consensus, our cooperation, our common purpose is our advantage. Indeed, the Royal Australian Navy has been heavily focused leveraging that advantage with our partners and friends through Indo-Pacific Endeavour and our near continuous regional presence deployments to our west, to our north and to our east. We, like you, are custodians of the Indo-Pacific, our region. Since 2017, our Navy has been conducting these significant deployments, maintaining our commitment to the region. These and many bilateral and multilateral cooperative activities amongst them work to strengthen and enhance navies and indeed our nation's interoperability and interchangeability. We must all keep this up and I'm sure that we will. Freedom of navigation and security at sea is fundamental to the world, not just any, any hemisphere, but globally. As the world economy grows, people prosper because the sea as a global common is safe and rightly to be assumed to be safe. Though, as we know, this growth, prosperity and safety must be actively maintained. It demands our continual attention and cannot be taken for granted. Our nation's people through our governments correctly expect that our navies, joint and combined forces will professionally deliver this. It is indeed our like-minded navies that are the key to secure good order at sea. So as nations might pursue their maritime interests and develop their maritime resources in a ecologically sustainable and peaceful manner. It is a contract we must never break. Not only are our platforms and people serious, seriously capable in and of themselves, we here in Australia benefit greatly from multiple alliances and partnerships close to home amongst our Pacific family, across the Indo-Pacific and of course across the entire world. We have all been busy despite the pandemic and since I stood here on this stage in 2019, our Australian Navy has achieved the final operating capability of Australia's two amphibious capability ships uh, centred around the helicopter dock ships HMAS Adelaide and HMAS Canberra. And we have done this in partnership with our brothers and sisters of the, of the Australian Army. We've commissioned HMAS Sydney, the final of our three destroyers, and we've achieved final operating capability across that class of ship. We've commissioned HMAS Stalwart and HMAS Supply, our two AORs, and we've bought state-of-the-art replenishment capability back to life in our Navy. We've launched the first OPV, new ship Arafura, the first of 12 vessels that will replace our Armadale class patrol boats. And we've taken ownership of the first evolved Cape class patrol boat with more to come. It's been a busy few years for a small sized Navy. As well, in response to the evolving strategic context, the Australian government's announcement to acquire at least eight nuclear powered submarines within the AUKUS Pact was a watershed moment for Australia's Navy and indeed Australia as a nation. In the meantime, we will continue to operate and evolve one of the most capable conventionally powered submarines in the world, the Collins class submarine. Through the life of type extension and on ongoing upgrades, Collins will unequivocally continue to be formidable and agile and will be equipped to respond to the challenges that we may yet face. Our government's annou announcement to accelerate maritime and land strike capabilities, including Tomahawk and Naval Strike Missile, is one that we welcome. It will undoubtedly help us build our capacity and to retain a thinking fighting an Australian Navy, one that is also ready to work together 
if necessary, to fight together with you, our partners of the world. I know I, show, I share a common view with my fellow chiefs that our people are the backbone of our navies and our maritime forces. Our people are the very lifeblood of our ability to fight and win at sea. Ongoing increases to the size, shape and capability of Australia's Navy workforce are critical to meet increasing demands upon us. Gratefully, we now have approval to grow and it's going to be a challenge for Australia and our Navy to meet, but it's a challenge that we must meet. We have no option. Quite frankly, a deeply national endeavour and it's vital that we share this to ensure the continued security and stability of our region. Our Navy is fit for purpose and we are ready and able to respond if or when needed. And I confidently assert we are fitter than when I last addressed this audience and we are getting fitter. The importance of this claim cannot be understated since we face very real threats to our established rules-based order from above, on and under the sea. As I mentioned earlier this week, the reliable estimate is that we will see between 250 and 300 submarines operating in the Indo-Pacific region in the near future. That's why the frigates we are building are optimised for anti-submarine warfare. It's also why they form part of a larger and necessarily ambitious undersea warfare program. In the lamentable spectre of conflict, we acknowledge the valour and commitment of those who are dedicated to defending our country and this region. But as we acknowledge the notable qualities of, of courage and, and sacrifice, we do not ever wish for war. We abhor all of those from which comes oppression and from the destruction of nations, we all seek peace, which recognises and honours all nations, which acknowledges the legitimate rights of all people. Our hope for peace and good order is underlined by our collective endeavour. Today, since we recognise the sea's limits, we also recognise the ever-present potential for conflict. And so we must work to assure the opposite. Here in Australia, our ships and people have and continue to execute maritime constabulary operations, securing borders and resources, conduct maritime search and rescue, saving lives of Australians and our international friends and partners, exercise constantly honing our capacity to defend and strike at the sea if we ever need to, and deploy on government-directed missions in support of friends, allies, and like-minded partners across the Indo-Pacific. But these missions and our coalitions have never been more consequential. Among the many valuable things this conference has allowed us to see this week it explains and helps us to understand why we have a Navy and how our Navy contributes to national power. It serves Australia's national interests and the Navy's fundamental nature in maintaining human rights and liberties. In what will be my final Sea Power Conference of Chief of Australia's Navy, as I draw it to close, I thank you all for your attendance for your support and your friendship. I thank you for your commitment to security across the Indo-Pacific and for safeguarding our way of life. And I thank you for your commitment to our commonality of purpose. I'd like to make special thanks to Captain Sean Andrews and his team from the Sea Power Centre Australia for the outstanding work they've done in pulling together this program. I call out Captain Simon Bateman and Commander Nicky Mann from Navy Events, 
uh, who have coordinated uh, the outstanding events and international events program. I also acknowledge Captain Ryan Gaskin and the international engagements team for the tireless work that they've put in bringing together 40 countries and 39 chiefs around the world. On a day-to-day -day basis, they have enough trouble corralling just one. I also thank the hundreds of my sailors and officers who have assisted in the planning and the execution of this marvellous event. And I also thank the spouses who have travelled from overseas and around the country uh, to support us this week. And I especially thank my spouse, Samantha, for her support to me and the spouse program. It's been truly wonderful. But most of all, I thank all of the men and women across all nations who go to sea and support from ashore and our uniformed and our civilian members who put their own well-being before their own. For, no, for, for almost four decades, I have been inspired by you. And very proud to serve alongside you. Thank you all for being here for the 2020 Sea Power Conference. And you are all warmly invited back to our conference next year. Thank you all. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Um, that concludes uh, the Sea Power Conference for 2022. Um, you're all invited and encouraged uh, to do some networking um, in the hall, uh, the exhibition hall, uh, prior to uh, coming to the ceremonial sunset, which should be in the conference centre forecourt um, at 1645. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>